I grew up in this really remote, freezing cold area of New York, and um, it was a combination of cold winters and very well stocked local video stores. So I just started watching and consuming movies and just watching things and watching things. And um, at a certain point, when I was probably a late teenager, I started to realize that uh, camera movements and camera placement and texture and quality of light and color were really a way to um, guide the form of a story and kind of inform an audience on multiple levels of what they should be feeling or uh, whose story was they were really experiencing in a moment. So I think when I was probably a late teen, I really started to zero in on cinematography as a craft and as a means of, um, as a means of telling stories. I had a high eight video camera when I was a kid. There was no one around. I was in cornfields where I lived, and so I'd make movies alone. With an, uh, I'd animate a uh, pipe cleaner man, and I would shoot light through marbles and just do weird things because I was alone, only child. And I'm, I had a cat that I would shoot sometimes too. So yeah, that was the origin. And then I found like an oasis, this video store in Delaware, when I was 15. And I walked in, and they had a whole shelf of Fassbender movies, the old New Yorker tapes that, that had come out in the 80s and early 90s. This is 1992, I guess, or 91, 92. And uh, yeah, and then I was able to just catch up on everything, and all the pretty girls, and all the European movies, and all the weird stuff, and all the crazy music, and everything that I've discovered also through movies led me different paths, and that's it. I first heard of Max Ophuls. Somehow, I didn't. I didn't have the like wonderful film school aha uh, experience that I think I should have had with him because he's just so, uh, he's such a huge presence in a lot of things that I've been working on in the years since. But I really, I think I encountered his name via Guy Madden, and it was when we were preparing uh, his film Keyhole, and I we had mentioned uh, Ophuls, and we had mentioned. Von Sternberg and and a bunch of movies kind of came up as we were prepping for things, but that that's when the name first jumped out, and I remember making like a little uh, note mark for it and kind of circling back to him on my own, and I'm really glad I did. I was probably 16 or 17 when I saw it, Letter from the Nun. I was watching it again, and I and I really did not remember a lot of it. I remember being impressed that Louis Jordan seemed to be playing some of the music himself which was, you know, impressive. For my childhood, he was the, you know, a guy that was in the Swamp Thing movie, which is very bad. But that's sort of, that's, I still think about that when I'm watching this movie even. Uh, it's a problem with growing up in the 80s. You've, you've, you've got a lot of uh, cl classic faces that you've seen only in their worst period, so. Cool to see them young again, but yeah, he's beautiful in it. When I think of something as being Ophel's esque I think of him really as um, someone who was able to, especially with his camera work and the lighting and his decisions on when to move a camera and how to move a camera, both subtly and in these grandiose, wonderful long takes that he's known for, I think of him as someone that um, is very efficiently and succinctly able to uh, share a character's inner life through the blocking of camera and actors. Um, and I don't think he was uh, the, f he was definitely not the first director that was very good at, at revealing an inner self and an inner monologue for someone to see in the third person. Um, but I just think he was so good at it. I was thinking about just his ability to create a, an emotional response through framing. And uh, I started to think about, well, what are, what are the other experiments that did this? And I, you know, the, the Kuleshov experiments with montage that the Soviets were doing like decades before, they're very interesting in that they, they could cut together disparate images and create a very visceral emotional response out of someone. And what's interesting to me is that uh, Ophels is able to do it within a single frame, that he's able to create moving frames at a time when um, people were kind of locking off and just shooting coverage, he's able to move a frame through an environment and tell you all about the environment that these people are living in, um, all about their inner lives through ascension of staircases and moving through public spaces and train stations. And, uh, and he's able to um, move the plot forward with dialogue as well. And it all sort of mixes together in this symphony. And on top of all of those things, um, 
when you're watching one of his films, you're seeing this dance that he's created with the machinery of filmmaking. Like he's, he's pulled off huge, elaborate set pieces. Um, and in a way, to me, that's very restrained. Like it's, they're um, unbelievably complex moves, uh, but like all functional cinematography should do, it doesn't call attention to itself. So it serves the story and it makes all of the subtext of inner emotions, time and place and a setting and uh, the dialogue, it all sort of adds to that and makes it greater than the sum of its parts in a way that I don't think other directors were doing, definitely not at that time. Movies that are entirely manually you know, operated, the camera, you know, everything is manually operated and there's just such a, um, um, it's not a charm, I think it's essential that I, I, I think that uh, the more we take cameras and put them on machines and gimbals and steady cam is in the middle, I would say, but on techno cranes and when it's uh, when its movements are all mechanical and not not hand operated, there, there's something that's uh, that's lost and sterilized by the whole experience, I, or it sterilizes the whole experience for me. I think I really am I'm not uh, excited to see these these robotically operated cameras anymore. So it's uh, it's one just one of many reasons that I, I love watching so much movement in, in these older films. Picturing the crew a little bit is fun, but also just, just feeling, you know, the almost perfect, you know, and like also as an operator, you know, you, you get that in the focus and everything. And when you really nail it, it's really the, it's a thrill. It's um, like a musician probably after, you know, after they soloed in, in, in a way that they didn't think they had ever, ever done before. You get that moment feels pretty great and I guess I kind of feel it a little bit when I watch some of these movies and also knowing the size of the cameras and just the whole everything that went into the movements and stuff uh, but but it for it being manual I think I think it's and especially with the organic you know just film shooting on film and manual movements and things it's a lot cozier by the time you read this letter I may be dead I have so much to tell you in particular with Ophels and, and this film, I think that uh, the long takes, they fit the sort of flashback, his remembrance of what she's written structure of this story, and that uh, things can kind of slow down and you can dwell on almost dreamlike details of things that may or may not have happened in real life. Um, and in particular, when I think about Ophels and um, uh, his DP, I, these were two gentlemen that had spent part of their formative years in Austria and escaped when it was consumed by what was going on in the middle of the century in Europe, uh, I think that when we start to see uh, Lisa and her, one of her suitors move through the public squares in Linz, you're, you're seeing like a, a sort of a ballet that's really a celebration of life of a place that doesn't exist anymore. And that was very formative to two of the key creators of this film. Um, and it, when I was watching it, it really feels like Ophuls was like, look, there was an Austria that was not evil it was not you know it was destroyed just like a lot of Europe was destroyed and there was something to celebrate here and there was a real place and a real time and as much as there's a, a, a flashiness and a melodrama to the characters involved in Letter from an Unknown Woman um, there's also I, I think a real subtext of like this was a, a lost chapter of these men's lives and I, I think the long takes really let you dwell on almost a documentary feel. Um, the lighting is also so strong, and it's so it's so uh, soft, also, and that's what I, I can't figure out how to do anymore with modern tools. Uh, no one shoots black and white that way. The film stocks don't exist, obviously, so the reaction to light is so differently, but it's so different. The contrast is entirely different. Shooting shooting in natural light versus artificial light would be even more distracting now if we tried to do that same sort of thing. Um, but things, things fall off in, in the grays and nicer ways back then too. I mean, just gelling lights different colors in black and white does change the quality it has on someone's face, for example. Uh, even though you think you don't have to worry about that because it's black and white, it's not true. So they had heavy, heavy, hot lights back then and everyone looked better. Not too long after they announced the beginning of Act Two and everybody's gone to the opera, Lisa has spotted Stefan and has made a sort of very blatant excuse to her husband about not feeling well and has left the opera and it's there's a very long beautiful shot where she descends the stairs and again we're back on this 
great fetishization of stairwells that this film has. Stairs seem to be the most important set piece for the 40s and 50s American movies. Everything had to be around a staircase. Nicholas Ray movies, of course, are always, uh, the big con conflicts are always around staircases. Lisa's descending the stairs, and it's a, just a very simple tracking shot, but there's an expanse to it. They back away from her, and it just it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and there's a beautiful sense of architecture and, and maybe a, a lost architecture that, that maybe was not thought of uh, as like sort of the grand Austrian idea, because we're just three years out of World War II at this point, and it's just a beautiful rendering of this woman's descent uh, from her husband and uh, the beginnings of an abandonment of a marriage for her and an obsession with this, with this man. So you have a literal sort of descent into a woman's psyche, but there's also this beautiful, beautiful um, opera that needs to be shown off. Stanley Kubrick, I think, uh, talked about him as his favorite director, I think at least form, for the form, and again for movement, I guess, and framing and things like that. So. Uh, the cinematography is pretty much what I associate with him uh, as far as like, what is his style. I don't know about themes other than tragic love and loss, uh, but the camera movement again and, and just sort of this elegance. Also, it's, you know, aristocratic settings where you can have a lot of things to look at in the frame. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't get too crazy with close-ups. He, he really lets you see the space and the places. I think the film really feels like it's very much in love with him more than her. She's very coy and cute and your heart's always with her, but to make the movie work it has to be so flattering to him. I mean, he just looks incredible every time, even, I mean, he's tragic, of course, you know, he's the talented guy that just can't help himself but screw up his life, but you're, he's constantly looking beautiful and, and remark, you know, you just, you just have to love him the whole time. He's enigmatic in every shot, and she's just sort of uh, like a lost kitten. Um, I feel like Lisa is so enamored with him and so just ready to sacrifice comfort and self-love and all of these things just to be with this guy who's really not that great from anybody that's watching the movie. And then I think there's also a pretty, um, a, a pretty valid reading that's just like it's we're seeing his version of what he thinks she's writing and um I, to me there's a there's a view of this movie that's like it's almost like this acceptance of this like self-hatred from this lothario right like where he just he see he sees what he wants her to see him as and then by the end he sort of accepts his fate that like he's he you know he even looks to um to his uh uh, his house staff and he's like you remembered her and and he did he, he even writes her name out and uh, And there's that moment of just like you see this acceptance and he's gonna he's gonna fight this duel with someone that's clearly gonna kill him uh, And it you know, I don't know if that's an upper of an ending But there is something interesting to me of like couching this beautiful Melodrama and it gets pretty melodramatic like the the machinery of the plot by the end the last ten minutes are really like people are dying and there's typhoid outbreaks and and I feel like they uh, very successfully take this melodrama and then have created something, whether intentionally or not, that really examines how um, this this man sees himself through the eyes of a woman that he treated horribly. And uh, you know, like I, there, we have her words; they're very literal there. But there's that uh, very explicit kind of dreamy uh, going out of focus from from him re reading her letter to the events of the story, and we hear her her words, but to me, like, we're seeing his vision of them. I mean, it's my favorite one of his movies. He, he's a world-class pianist, but he lives in uh, like a boarding house for so long in the movie. I don't really understand why he doesn't have like a really nice uh, home of his own, except I guess that he's just a kind of a, a, a little bit of a louse. And I think that that's obviously something that people always want to want to relate to or sort of find something something relatable in and critics romanticize those characters of course I mean if he if it had been somewhere else he would have been a junkie I guess if the movie took place in a different time and place he could have been any of those things and there's always a romantic you know for film people those are romantic characters losers
For me, the the ongoing appeal of Letter from an Unknown Woman is is that like any really solid piece of art, it just it's open to multiple reinterpretations. So, you know, there's there's just a lot of ways you can read this film, and it it has to do with how competently it's made. It has to do with the time and place that it's dealing with, and that it, it's a very specific grand moment in modern history that no one can go back to after the events of Europe in the mid mid uh, 20th century uh, and it has to do with the structure of it the way that we follow the words of a woman as they're seen by a man and we might be seeing her vision of her words but we might be seeing his version of uh, what transpired between them and um, how that sort of those two separate readings can kind of define what um, people might think of as as uh, melodramatic and Hollywood-based gender roles at a certain point in time. I feel like there's a way to see this as a beautiful classic melodrama. I see that there's a way you could read this as uh, sort of an indemnification of male self-mythologizing. Uh, I feel like there's a way that you can see this as the way that um, uh, Hollywood cinema of a certain place and time may have victimized the women that carried these narratives. And there's just there's just a lot of ways to read it, and on top of that, it's gorgeous. I mean, I just I I I wish I could shoot something that looked this beautiful, and I don't know with digital technology if that's ever possible again. I don't know if you can shoot memories to be as as um, beautifully haloed and gauzed and and uh, so succinctly um, uh, like a tactile, literal translation of what a fading memory should feel like, and that's. Uh, creating that kind of emotional response in someone is like that's the the job of anyone telling stories in cinema and it just Ophuls does it so well and it's so timeless that we're talking about it 70 years later.